There is no game technology in existence that has achieved quite the same level of impact, influence and enduring popularity as the Doom engine. In 1993, exactly three decades ago this very year, the Garage Punks at id Software unleashed the first installment of the Masterwork game series that single-handedly brought the first-person shooter into existence as a proper genre, revolutionizing the entire industry in the process. In the 30 years since then, the Doom engine has become the medium's preeminent gold standard for game engine tech due to its near limitless adaptability, modularity, and portability. Although credit where credit is due, you gotta give a special runner up prize to Bethesda for how they've leveraged the highly moddable Game Bryo creation engine technology in almost all of their mainline games since the release of Morrowind in 2002. If you're here for trouble, you'll get more than you bargain for. But even compared to contemporaries like Gamebryo, the Doom engine truly stands in a class all its own. Its low overhead and near endless scalability is why, but can it run Doom, has become one of the longest running and most well-known memes in all of gaming. The engine's sheer versatility has birthed incarnations of Doom that can run on oscilloscopes, tractors, fridges, ATM machines, the touch bar of a MacBook Pro, and even on a TI-83 graphic calculator, as demonstrated by LGR here. I think this is super fascinating and Doom. Or even inside of other games like playing Doom in Minecraft, Sonic Mania, or Doom itself. <laughs> oh yeah, it's Doomception. And all of this is only possible because John Carmack had the foresight and conviction to turn Doom open source. First in 1997 as a not-for-profit proprietary license, and then again in 1999 under the GNU General Public license. This declaration of independence birthed a plethora of magnificent source boards that allow anyone to enjoy Doom today on just about any kind of hardware or operating system. Ports like Zendronum, PR Boom, Cheesy Doom, and Chocolate Doom, just to name some of the most popular. But even well before the open sourcing and the arrival of the first source ports, Doom's genre-defining impact and legacy were all but assured thanks to its inclusion of robust and accessible tool sets for creating maps and other user-generated content, which were indeed some of the first of their kind for a piece of world-sweeping mass entertainment software back in the early to mid-1990s. Yeah, yeah. And this, plus the simultaneous rise of the early internet and local area network technology, meant that Doom's impact on the games industry was nothing short of a thermonuclear explosion. A lot of the retailers are getting demand for Doom already, so they know that when Doom 2 comes out, they're going to be able to sell a lot of product. In other words, Doom was a very very early example of what games can achieve when their main design priorities and tech implementations focus on empowering players and the community's creativity rather than making every decision based on capricious whims of investors and shareholders. The combination of open sourcing plus widely available custom mapping tools is what gave rise to Doom's vibrant modding and total conversion scene, which is still active, thriving and handing out yearly CAC awards to this day. In a very real and direct way, this whole boomer shooter retro craze that we're currently enjoying has arisen thanks in no small part to the innumerable Doom mega fans who never stopped publishing new wads, mods and entire new games over the past three decades. And amongst this cornucopia of Doom goodness, there is one recent mod in particular that not only thoroughly nailed its wildly ambitious premise, but basically set a new high bar all on its own. It's a challenging, cerebral, mechanically dense and highly atmospheric immersive sim light shooter set in the irradiated post-Armageddon wasteland of the southeastern United States. Ashes 2063 by the dynamic modding duo of Vostjok and Reform Joe, if I had to explain it during an elevator ride, is equal parts Fallout, Mad Max, and Stalker, as in both the film and the games. 
It plays out across expansive and highly interactive levels that so totally transform and elevate the source material that it's based on that you'd be forgiven for thinking that Ashes is actually derived from build engine titles like Blood or Duke Nukem 3D rather than the original Doom games. Gotcha. In other words, Ashes takes all the best bits from 70s, 80s and 90s sci-fi action and horror, puts them into a blender and hits the nuclear smoothie setting. What results is not just one of the best Doom total conversions I've ever come across, but easily one of the most atmospheric, engaging and creative action horror shooter experiences this side of the Atlanta wastes. There simply is no place like Zone. All right, before we continue, a thank you to Honey PayPal for sponsoring this video. So let me take a moment to show you what they have to offer you. You know how nearly every online store has a coupon field in the checkout, right? And most of the time you don't have a coupon ready that could skim a couple of bucks off your order. Maybe you're like me and you've searched and ended up on these shady coupon sites, tried a few and found they're all void anyway and you wasted your time for nothing. Well, that's where Honey comes in. It's a little shopping tool you add to your browser at no charge that pops up with a little button when it detects a coupon field. All you have to do is click and it goes through currently viable options for that store at the moment and automatically applies the one with the biggest savings. Easy. It works for surprisingly many online stores and easily integrates with the places where you're already buying. I often forget all about even having it and then get a little rush of excitement whenever it pops up and ends up saving me a good bit off an order where I didn't even expect it. Just give it a try and see for yourself. And hey, if you want to support this channel a tiny bit while doing it, then feel free to get it at joinhoney.com slash Ragnaroks. So thanks a lot again to our sponsor and for your attention. And now I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. Leather-clad Nitro Raiders sporting blood-red and slime-green spiky hairdos scour the crumbling remnants of a once-great capitalist empire. Formerly bustling skyscrapers and shopping malls now lie empty and silent, save for the scuttling paws of acid-vomiting dinosaur dogs and the gurglings of irradiated abominations during their best Arnold impressions. <laughs> In short, just another day in the radiated nightmare wasteland of Atlanta, Georgia. Our story begins from the POV of an unnamed and unassuming wasteland scavenger, helpfully nicknamed Scav by the denizens of the Boneyard, a free city erected among the ruined exurbs of that once glorious citadel of the South. Some seven decades after a gigantic global thermonuclear conflagration, the remnants of humanity are reduced to a hard scrabble existence amongst the remains of what passes for civilization, eking out survival through the clever use of salvaged machinery and overwhelming firepower. Ashes is notable for being a total conversion mod of Doom, realized in the GZ Doom Sourceport engine. Basically a from the ground up modification that transforms Doom into an entirely new game. Of course, like other source ports, GZ Doom is a powered up version of Doom that far exceeds the capabilities of the vanilla engine. Pretty much all of Ashes' most spectacular set pieces are made possible thanks to the enhanced capabilities of GZ Doom, along with the use of software rendering tech that just wasn't available in the original, like voxels, bright maps, and colored lighting. The initial versions of Ashes Episodes 1 and 2 required files from the original Doom 2 to play. That meant you needed to pull the main doom2.wad file from a retail installation of Doom 2, or an old CD or floppy diskette if you're an old school grognard, and then configure the source port to launch Ashes alongside the wad. But thanks to a recent update celebrating the completion of the Ashes duology, episodes 1 and 2 are now playable as pre-assembled standalone packages, which you can play totally free of charge, no extra files needed and no strings attached. Episode 1, titled Ashes 2063 and first released in 2018, is basically a self-contained introduction to the setting and gameplay, with focused progression and a well-paced narrative that serves as a kind of proof of concept or blueprint. This first chapter was solo developed by Vostjok and is a more linear and directed point A to point B adventure that will feel familiar to fans of retro throwback shooters. 
After that, Vostok and Reform Cho changed the game with the release of Episode 2 Afterglow in late 2021. This sequel follow-up takes damn near every concept and design element laid down in the first chapter and blows them up like a czar bomb, uh, giving Afterglow a truly epic in every sense of the word scope and feel. More weapons, more enemies, more unique maps, more dialogue, more quests, more lore. It is the classic example of a bigger and better sequel. Instead of the more straightforward progression of Episode 1, Afterglow is a quasi-open-world first-person adventure with Metroidvania-style, or as it's called in Japan, search action progression, whose open-ended structure allows for a wide degree of player expression and freedom in the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. Across Afterglow's two main hub zones, the player is free to pursue quests and tackle objectives at their own pace and discretion in almost any order they choose. And each zone features subquests, loads of unique NPC interactions, and the well-realized upgrade and crafting system that allows you to engineer some satisfyingly kick-ass enhancement to your arsenal of destructions, and fits the setting perfectly. Taken together, Ashes 2063 and Afterglow are a one-two punch that offers some of the most satisfying and addictive action game and gunplay of any FPS in recent years. An experience that puts many of the AAA big boys in the corner of shame. Episode 1 of Ashes establishes a setting and mythology pulled from a grab bag of the weird pop cinema sci-fi of decades past. Some seven decades after World War III kicked off in the late 1990s, as we all remember, the entire surface of the planet has been glassed and blasted into a nuclear wasteland, which then triggered massive earthquakes that irrevocably scarred the planet's land masses. As the lone wolf protagonist, you'll have to brave the mean streets of Atlanta equipped with a motorcycle, a style and all leather outfit, and a supremely badass short barrel pump action shotgun. One day, while on a routine salvage mission, the scavenger discovers a pre-war hand-cranked radio that picks up a strange transmission from seemingly out of nowhere. A mysterious feminine voice endlessly repeating a sequence of digits, like one of those classic creepy Cold War number stations. One, two. And right after you make your way through the first two introductory levels and arrive at the first friendly encampment, you'll instantly get a feel for just how impressive the scope of Ashes is, even in this first, more self-contained episode. Every single NPC you meet in town can be interacted with via a Fallout slash Bioware-esque dialogue system. And more than a few of these conversations offer extensive dialogue trees that play out across a dozen or more steps, featuring deliciously pulpy exposition that's also appropriately enticing, teasing the various mysteries of the post-apocalyptic setting and compelling lore-minded players ever onward. Not only do these interactions offer the player a steady drip feed of that sweet, sweet lore, Talking with NPCs can also unlock various side quests that offer rewards in the form of scrap currency, better armor and equipment, ammunition, or powerful new weapons. And on top of that, there's also a rudimentary barter system where you can trade bits and bobs of scrap you've gathered for gear, ammo, and restoratives. Just in this opening tutorial town, there are a handful of NPC conversations gating the main quest, three separate NPCs you can barter with, and a hidden quest given by totally not Snake Plissken that leads to a secret level at a nearby hydroelectric dam. And the player can enjoy this game's non-shooter elements and side content a la carte, engaging with as much or as little of it as they choose. If you're the sort of lore nerd who hungers to play Ludo archaeologist and excavate every scrap of data you can, have at it. But if you'd rather not bother with any of that and just want to speed on through the murder labyrinth switch hunting and the shooty bang bang bits, well, Ashes got you covered there as well. But just like its hard on sleeve inspirations, Ashes very much encourages the player to engage with its setting and side content as much as possible, if only because resources and ammunition are so scarce that you're incentivized to search every nook and cranny of every map. Environmental hazards abound too, requiring the player to use a rechargeable solar-powered lantern to explore some of the game's unilluminated zones, so you'll need to carefully monitor the interface's built-in Geiger counter meter to make sure you're not straying too far into danger, because radiation poisoning is unforgiving, and just a handful of seconds spent in the rad zone will have you glowing like a Christmas tree as your precious health points tick, tick, tick down relentlessly. 
And keep in mind, all of these gameplay elements and mechanics are introduced and teed up for the player just in the first 20 to 30 minutes of the first episode. It makes for an exquisite kickoff to a sprawling shooter saga that will see our scavenger hero trek across a desert wasteland surrounding Atlanta and through the dark and irradiated heart of the city, scaling vertiginous skyscrapers and plumbing the depths of secret military installations along the way. What begins as a fairly straightforward spin on the Mad Max narrative aesthetic framework gets progressively stranger, more terrifying and downright Strugatskian as the plot advances, with strange paranormal occurrences, omnicidal artificial intelligence and hubristic mad science experiments running amok across this and potentially many other multiverse timelines. To meet these dangers head-on, the scavenger can equip themselves with pistols, shotguns, pipe bombs, SMGs, assault rifles, a napalm launcher, a frickin' railgun, and various other implements of mass destruction. The gunplay is both appropriately tactical for the game's stalker light mechanics and also incredibly satisfying due to its fantastic pacing, thumping and juicy sound design and overall incredibly responsive game feel. The audio elements deserve special attention for being as strong and well implemented as anything you'll hear in a big budget AAA release. The score too is appropriately propulsive and synth-wavy, perfectly complementing the post-nuclear action extravaganza setting and vibe. The sound design of individual weapons is also absolutely stellar, with appropriately boomy and percussive gunshots that reverberate and echo appropriately depending on whether you're in a wide or narrow indoor or a sprawling outdoor sector of the map. Beyond just the general excellence of the sound, Ashes also shows a keen understanding of how to best leverage the visual half of audiovisual to lend maximum impact to any given scene. Like, after you've let your pump action shotgun ring out a half dozen times, you'll have to deal with a very undoom like game mechanic reloading. So, once your shotgun is empty, reloading isn't just a simple matter of watching the gun sprite dip off screen and then re emerge with fresh shells locked and loaded, Goldeneye style. If you'll permit me to get all Big Boss Naked Snake for a moment. Nearly every part of this gun has been expertly crafted and customized. Every single weapon in the Ashes duology has its own unique, elaborate and true-to-life reload animation, which adds an enormous degree of tactical depth to the gameplay, as well as a generous helping of gun porn. Like with the shotgun, reloading will take a little bit of extra time when it's empty. First, the last empty shell is ejected, then new shells get loaded individually, with the first one accurately being inserted straight into the barrel, and then finally you give her one last pump to chamber the live round before you back in action. Or once you empty the magazine of your 9mm auto pistol, observe how the slide of the gun sprite locks into place waiting for the player to slap in a fresh magazine, again mimicking the slide lock functions on a real life clock. Definitely some gun nut levels of detail at work here, and I say this with love. The enemies also have that telltale mark of good shooter design, trademark. Not only are the silhouettes, colors and sprites all distinct and easily legible at a glance, but each foe also features unique and instantly recognizable audio cues, hit grunts and death cries. So regardless of whether there's an acid spitting dino dog, an irradiated mutant or a mohawk nitro raider around the corner, the careful player who uses all of their senses will rarely be caught off guard and will usually be able to intuit their next best course of action. In the grand scheme, Ash's combat also feels extremely well-tuned, thanks in large part to the tight-fisted approach to ammo distribution. This is the sort of game where you'll need to make every shot count and swap weapons frequently to accommodate for distance and enemy types, and running out of ammo is a real and ever-present danger. Which means, when you're getting up close and personal with the mutants, you might want to reserve your precious last few hand cannon bullets and instead go for the old fire boot knife quick attack or switch over to a trusty crowbar to get in a few good whacks and save precious ammo. It all combines into a whole that is truly greater than the sum of its parts, with combat encounters that are equal parts tense, thrilling and addictive. The gunplay and game feel are so eminently satisfying and the soundtrack is such a ripshot good time, in no time at all you start to feel like the hero of your own personal 80s action epic. This virtuous interplay between the audiovisual and mechanical elements shows just how much thought, time and care went into the creation of Ashes. 
This is a positively insane the membrane degree of attention to detail for a game made by a two-person dev team for completely free and assembled in a modified version of the humble old Doom engine. Ashes is such a complete and total modification of Doom that there's almost nothing of the original game remaining, save for the base engine itself and a handful of throwaway gags. And all of these gameplay and design elements coalesce into a supremely convincing and compelling throwback to a certain subgenre of post-apocalyptic 80s action flicks, one that's no less impressive for how it began its life via the building blocks of the now three decades old Doom 2. So, after making their way through the dark and irradiated heart of Atlanta, the scavenger discovers that the number sequence was being transmitted by a somehow still functioning radio station atop a skyscraper downtown. Which, in turn, leads you deep underneath the tower, where you discover a pre-war US military installation with exquisite environmental storytelling that hints at strange human experimentations and a vast techno-military conspiracy that may very well have kicked off World War III. And in the innermost sanctum of this twisted temple to pre-war mankind's technological hubris is Athena, an alternate reality version of ChatGPT? Yeah, in all the multiverse there's really no downtime where artificial intelligence doesn't turn everything to shit and blow up the world it seems. Well, Athena seems friendly, and helpful at least. Just look at that smiley emoticon. Who couldn't trust a face like that? After powering up the facility's supercomputer at Athena's command and struggling through a suitably epic boss fight against a rocket launching super mutant, everything comes crashing down on top of the scavenger. We awaken weeks later in episode 2, Afterglow. And right from the outset, the narrative stakes are ratcheted up in a way that totally fits the second chapter's expanded scope and intensity. In the time you were unconscious, an army of mutants began to march northwards, and outposts all across the region have gone dark. There's a new gang in town too, seizing every bit of ammo and scrap they can get their hands on in service to a mysterious warlord. What begins as a simple mission to repair your bike and get the hell out of Dodge morphs into a true post-nuclear epic, with the scavenger picking up and unraveling many of the mysteries and story threads laid down in episode 1. And after an explosive mid-game set piece that sees you escape from Atlanta, Pliskin style, you'll continue northwards in pursuit of the mutant army in yet another secret military installation, one that might hold the key to all the mysteries and loose ends you've been pursuing. I'm speaking in very broad terms here, because the world building and story of Ashes is actually quite phenomenal, and players should experience as much of it as possible with as little advanced knowledge as possible. That's my recommendation. And what's even more remarkable about Afterglow is how the narrative unfolds in a non-linear fashion that mirrors the gameplay. There are two main open-ended hub zones in Afterglow, and each of these hub zones are bookended by more linear and directed narrative-heavy segments at the intro, midpoint, and finale. With both hub zones, the player is free to explore at their own discretion and pursue their objectives in any order. Quest givers and NPCs will often provide helpful tips about which areas will be more or less challenging, but the enterprising scaver is free to charge right into the enemy's ravenous maw in pursuit of premium gear and boomsticks. And of course, there are plenty of wonderful aha uh -huh, environmental shortcuts where you'll suddenly and unexpectedly unlock a helpful route back to places you've already explored. There's plenty of hidden lore and eye-catching environmental storytelling in these quasi-open-world sections too, and I mean like actual storytelling via the environmental design, not just making references based on an item's flavor text and where you found it. Afterglow is also where Ashes really cranks up the immersive sim factor, with stealth frequently being a viable option. In many of the more combat-heavy encounters, the careful player will get the opportunity to move undetected and execute some silent melee takedowns to whittle away at the enemy ranks before you start letting the lead fly. And there's a huge amount of variation and complexity to the levels across both episodes of Ashes. Again, the map design and layouts here are simply top-notch, blending the lifelike, varied feel of real-world locations with tightly wound and interconnected murder labyrinths that are a pure joy to blast your way through.
This extreme degree of granular interactivity and interconnectedness is what I meant earlier when I noted that while Ashes might be running on Doom tech, an execution feels a whole lot more akin to a build engine title like Duke Nukem 3D, which likewise flaunted its rich environments and interactivity as a huge step up over its more static and primitive contemporaries. Damn, I'm looking good. The variety on display here is seriously impressive. In addition to the derelict urban environs, there are ominous abandoned military bunkers housing terrifying secrets, wide open highways where you'll do pitched battle with raiders and mutants, a rock and laser tag labyrinth arena complete with a post-game light show, an abandoned greenhouse whose mutated flora gives new meaning to the word overgrowth, and not to mention my personal favorite, Anomaly 210, the haunted remains of the Soviet Aquila class nuclear submarine Philadelphia a winking reference to the Philadelphia Experiment conspiracy that somehow dimension hopped its way into an irradiated crevasse on the outskirts of Alana. And it's astonishing how much atmosphere Ashes manages to squeeze out of its engine and at times become downright terrifying. You wouldn't think that ancient game tech like the Doom Engine is capable of creating such an expressive and engrossing horror experience, but this game proves that there's plenty of life left in them spooky old bones. This is definitely one of those cases where, if you can stomach it, you want to play in the dark with headphones on and then volume cranked up. The whole of it makes for an incredibly immersive experience, which is exactly what I'm talking about when I refer to Ashes 2063 as an immersive sim light. The extensive game mechanics and systems are bolstered by so much fight or sneak or flee or use tools and environment cunningly variety to the level and encounter design, and it's all packed together via a staggering degree of attention to even the smallest bits of audiovisual detail. Thanks to the huge and interconnected maps, the high quality audio visual design, the deep granular mechanics and the highly compelling progression system, Ashes truly and properly immerses you into its setting. The player feels like they're really inhabiting the role of a nameless wandering stalker scavenger struggling to eke out survival and find meaning to existence in this ruined world. There is also actual role-playing to be done here with meaningful player choices. And I'm not just talking about player agency in terms of how you level up by allocating your upgrade resources to craft new armaments and weapon modifications, though well, of course there's plenty of joyous carnage to be found there as well. At several points throughout Afterglow, the player will be prompted to choose between various NPCs or factions to help or fight against. And these choices have meaningful consequences for how later sections of the game play out. Fallout says hi. And then, appropriately, at the end of Afterglow, you're treated the iconic style of post-game ending slides that further flesh out the ramifications of the player's choices across their journey. Post-nuclear role-playing is alive and well, comrades. Nor is unknown where he's currently headed. One thing is certain. He's probably gonna complain about it when he gets there. Again, it feels almost impossible to overstate just how incredibly polished and engaging this game is to play, in ways that put so many modern AAA releases to shame. Like, I genuinely mean this. I've reached for damn near every bit of verbal hyperbole in the book for this script, and it still doesn't feel like I'm doing justice to Ashes. So many modern, sprawling, open-world action RPGs out there I've tried that lost me after a while because I could see the same old mandatory grab bag of artificial progression mechanics unfurl in front of my eyes, making everything feel so tacked on and same. Can't afford to risk not to add an extensive, nauseating skill tree with 500 skills that give you 3% more lighting damage against undead enemies, and there's absolutely no way a modern AAA game can afford not to shoehorn the same boring crafting system because you gotta have it. Meanwhile, pretty much nothing in Ashes feels like it's just padding or just there because that's what every game needs right now. Everything has its place and there's a good reason for why it's implemented and it adds to the coherence of the world it creates for the players to inhabit. And even the gunplay is snappier, more responsive, better sounding and just plain feels better to play than so many modern shooters, all pulled off on a shoestring budget in comparison. 
There's an incredibly strong story and deep world building that makes you genuinely interested in learning more about the setting. Each and every area is a veritable smorgasbord of Metroidvania delights to the senses, featuring smartly designed and interconnected maps with loads of secrets, shortcuts, and environmental storytelling, both humorous and deadly serious. And the festive ribbon that ties this whole package together is the absolutely banging synthwave soundtrack by John S. Weekly, a composition that easily goes toe to toe with the strongest output of your Aubrey Hodges and Mick Gordon's. And Vostyok, stand-up gent that he is, still isn't accepting payment or donations for his work on Ashes in any way. So if you end up playing and enjoying the game a lot, why not do the next best thing and throw a couple of bucks to the composer's wave for the soundtracks to Ashes 2063 and Afterglow? Ashes 2063 deserves all the support in the world and more because this is a true retro shooter masterwork. If you're a fan of classic FPSs, or even just boomer shooter curious, or hell, even if you just love satisfying gameplay and post-apocalyptic pulp fiction, then you run. Don't walk over to ModDB and download Ashes today. It doesn't cost a thing. There are presently quite a few paid commercial games that use the open source GZ Doom software as their engine, and you can find any number of them on Steam, GOG, Itch.io, or wherever else great games are sold. There is even a helpful GZ Doom Games curator group on Steam if you'd like to see the most high profile examples all collected in the same place. And let me be 100% crystal clear, that's no criticism nor shade to any of these steps, because these titles are excellent games on their own merits. Plus, they use GZ Doom in a transformative way that absolutely justifies charging some cold hard cash for the all-consuming amount of time and effort it takes to do game dev well. It's technically no different to making a game in Unity or Unreal. But that's also what makes Ashes 2063 so damn remarkable and eminently worthy of all the praise I just heaped upon. This is a totally non-commercial, open source, standalone, free game that is just as strong or even stronger than many of the latest and greatest AAA big budget spectacle shooters. And best of all, as previously mentioned, Ashes is a standalone package. That means you don't even need to mess around with in-game consoles or command lines to get it running, as is the case with many other mods of classic shooters. Just download, unzip, and double-click the Play Episode patch file. Alright, so before we ramp up to the ending, I just want to give a special and extremely heartfelt shout out to Michael Saber here, who's done a ton of heavy lifting on, well, far more than just this video. Like, some of you might be aware of this, but Michael's been writing and recently also occasionally helping out with video cutting for this channel for years now, and as a matter of fact, he was also the one who made me aware of Ashes in the first place and penned the original script for this video. Wow, that's a lot of words. Too bad I'm not reading them. Anyway, Michael's been on a Doom Watt deep dive as of late, we played a good handful together and we thought, before we let you off the hook, why not share some of our current topics with you guys? So, I'm just gonna pass the mic to Mike. Hey Rag, and hello everyone. It's me, your favorite co-writer and producer of this here Ragnarok's channel. I couldn't be prouder of the work we've done for, what is it, six or seven years now. Yep, the channel started in 2014 and we've been working together on scripts regularly since 2016, so yeah, that's a good seven years by now. Time really flies. Yeah, Tempest Fugit indeed. All right, go ahead and bless us with Doom. There are way too many amazing Doom mods to cover them all here, but if you're an enterprising Doomer who would like to go even deeper into the scene, here, in no particular order, are some must-play highlights. ALT by Clan BOS is something of a close cousin of Ashes, bringing enormous roadside picnic energy to its depiction of a strange and surrealistic Doom Zone. It looks and plays like classic Doom at first, but this is merely a facade that draws you ever deeper into a murky, upside-down world where there's no fixed reality, and the constitutive elements of the series are continuously rearranging themselves, often in startling ways. Eternal Doom by Team Eternal and Team TNT is, so to speak, the one that started it all. This gigantic 32-map megawatt was one of the first ever Doom custom campaigns, featuring new maps, new music, and another heaping helping of dirty sci-fi tech, eldritch horror, and Iron Maiden album cover cheese. 
you just can't overstate this mod's important, which is no doubt why id Software double-dipped on the name and gave it a loving nod with 2020's Doom Eternal. And my final recommendation is Sunlust by Zach Stevens and Daniel Jacobson. Fast, loud, polished, utterly ingenious, and totally uncompromising. Sunlust is the Doom formula polished to a mirror sheen and honed to a razor's edge. It is, as the 2012 CAC Awards so memorably put it, a renaissance, a marriage of slaughter gameplay with impressive, striking macro texture worthy of the finest heavy metal album covers. And if you'd like to see more, we've assembled a helpful doc with links to a demon's horde of must-play Doom mods. And oh yeah, for those of you who enjoy my content, Keep your head on a swivel because I'm in the finishing stretch of a very exciting mega video about the legends of game emulation. Back to you, Rag. All right, that should have you covered for several evenings of Doom Watt extravaganza. And yeah, I just want to reinforce that last bit. If you haven't watched Michael's videos over on his channel, then you're seriously missing out. I can blanket recommend literally every single video he's made over the past years. And if you're familiar with my channel and the strong focus on especially old games that have been left in the dirt by non-caring publishers, absolutely check out his video on Panzer Dragoon Saga and keep your eyes peeled for the upcoming Legends of Emulation Juggernaut, which is shaping up to be an absolute tome dedicated to celebrating a regular avalanche of amazing games that are all at this point in time virtually exclusively enjoyable through emulation. Link to Michael's channel you'll find in the description of this video and via the card that just popped up in the top right corner. That's as long as YouTube doesn't remove the feature at some point in the future, like annotations. Still salty about that. Anyway, you know, I joked about hyperbole earlier, but the observation that Ashes is one of the most magnificent and compelling games I've played in years, this really doesn't feel like an extreme statement to me at all. Ashes is a triumph and a testament to the dedication and ingenuity of the two dudes who brought it to life, in many ways like Carmack and Romero before them. But of course, just like those cheesy inspirational posters of Jesus Christ's footprints on a sandy beach, the community first spirit of Doom has been carrying the load for some three decades now. For almost 30 years, the open source nature of Doom has given rise to a near infinite library of free entertainment for shooter fans to enjoy. There's literally never been a better time to dive in and enjoy all that Doom has to offer and things are only getting better and better as months and years go by. There's been plenty of talk lately about how, thanks to some recent buggy AAA releases and their troubled launches, PC gaming has entered a new dark age. Speed! Aim for the driver! To hear the loudest voices of the discourse tell it, we're back to bad old days when consoles reign supreme and PC users were left with overpriced scraps to nibble on and be happy about it. Well, I'm calling bullshit on that brainworm of a meme because if you can just manage to break free from the Medusa's gaze of whatever latest and greatest shitfest is currently sucking all the oxygen out of the room, it's plain to see that we're presently in something of a golden age for PC gaming. It feels like a regular postmodern era of indie gaming, if you ask me. From independent games on itch.io to the modding scenes of long-running titles like Doom, to the latest mid-budget AA releases on GOG and Steam, there has never been such a vast variety of interesting and excellent games available, and at such affordable prices to boot. And that's before we even get into how those indie and mid-tier games often go on super sale for a couple of bucks a pop. So in that sense, to me, Ashes 2063 represents both the culmination and current apotheosis of Doom's hyper-dedicated modding scene. It is nothing short of a ludic monument to human ingenuity and creativity, an artistic work whose impact and influence will no doubt echo through the years, just like its source material before it. Because while ashes are nothing but dust in the wind, and an afterglow only lingers for a few precious minutes, doom is eternal. Yeah, wow. And that short conversation with Michael earlier, it really dawned on me that this channel is already nine years old. Wow, like not much more and it's a whole decade. Okay, that sounds a bit like a child being asshole there. I kind of like, I'm nine, almost 10. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's absolutely crazy. And I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you, my viewers and audience. 
Uh, if this was your first video of mine, hey, I'm Ragnar, and on this channel I largely cover either horror games, old games, indie games, or combinations thereof, and I'm sure you'll find a good deal of enjoyable content in my backlog by now. And yeah, you make this possible, those who tune in regularly, those who just watch for the first time, and also those who support me over on Patreon. Without the continuous financial support of my backers, that's a fact, this channel wouldn't be here anymore. So thank you, earnestly. And if you'd like to help us out as well, feel free to hop over to Patreon and join the community with a monthly pledge within your comfort levels. It really does make a huge difference. And as at the end of every video, here is my big special shout out to my top tier supporters. Thank you kindly to Louise Lane, Chrissy, Felix, Kerry George, Uziel1447, Matt Gretton, Shannon Blue, Isabella Stoner, Laird Dwakala, Dr. Haley Isabella Colley, John Boring, Arcadian Knight, Rafkins and Triscuits, Corey Marr, Casper Rahm, Cannon Ward, Hippo Hobbley, Terraflops, Federico Rocha, Morrigan Kay, Nathan Gillick, The Wretched, Lawrence E. Buben, Felix D., Dana Rosa, Nineball9606, Ronan Crom, aka Daniel242172, Kyle Lee, Tleben, Disco Dwarf, Alex Popov, Swiss Hackmod, Amber Wiggins, Maria Rios, Raisha Griggs, Nika the Brave, David Zelenak, Vasily Prokhorov, Chuck Taylor, Ashtier, Giselle, Jin Hansen, The Spiral Architect, Lillen B, Thomas Bona, Hunter Crawford and Margaret Strawn, Catherine Escobar, Zotti, Terry Collins, Franz Johannes Foilner, Tabby, Gehanas, Vincent Cavanaugh, Lucas Ferreira Leite, Billy Lott, Link Hughes, Swagum, Boris Bugling, Samantha, Sable Cowell, Sam Laurel, Sterina Abramson, Thomas Patrick Hooper, and Aurora Melpomene Crescendo. Until next time, ta-ta.